Denis wins the Mini Transat. Dual Tweet Aja in the Class 40 at the Jacques Vabre. The Triple Crown of Surfing sweeps Hawaii. And now, from the Nautical Channel Newsroom, here is Mia Cheran. Plunge into the action with NC Sports. Welcome back to a brand new edition of NC Sports, your water sports central. I'm Mia Charan and here's the latest from around the world. A fast and furious mini transat for Frédéric Denis, a winner in Guadeloupe. Le Conservateur and DMB fight to the TGV finish line in Brazil. Dismast and face ocean for our very own Sébastien Destromont. A day on the X-Cat in Abu Dhabi. Hawaii's Triple Crown tops the WSL season. Bernard Schopfer on the future of sailing at the Yacht Racing Forum. Plus, so much more. Here's NC Sports director Jero Malingri with a recap of the latest results from the Mini Transat Il de Guadeloupe and the Class 40s at the Jacques Vabre. <laughs> vraiment ce que je cherchais c'était de traverser parce que voilà c'est ce que ça fait des années que j'en rêvais et puis là euh, ouais tout s'est un peu bien enchaîné donc euh, et puis voilà je, je pense qu'à un moment j'ai vraiment pris confiance aussi sur la première étape on a du vent fort on a eu un mois de stop donc j'ai bien analysé cette phase là et ça m'a servi énormément sur la deuxième phase où j'ai réussi à créer un break je pense assez vite et à, à ensuite jouer mon jeu devant quoi now a winner in Pointe à Pitre in under 13 days, Frédéric Denis has plenty to be proud of. Since his breakaway from the pack in Cape Verde and his deep south option did pay off in what will be remembered as one of the fastest mini transats in history. Holding average speeds above 10 knots with his Nauti Park, the French skipper managed to keep a safe 70 nautical mile gap on direct pursuers. Italian Michele Zambelli on Illumia in second and another Frenchman, Luc Berry, in third place with Association Rêve. Jean Poulvet on Noventis took top honors in the series division with both Lipinski on Entreprise Innovante and Le Tourquet with Terreal on his tail all the way to the finish line. Meanwhile, in Brazil, a match racing finale marked the last chapter of the Transat Jacques Vabre with the arrival of the Class 40s. This regatta went literally down to the wire as Yannick Bistavin and Pierre Brasseur saw their comfortable lead slowly being eroded by Maxime Sorel and Sam Manuard. After nearly 7,000 nautical miles across the Atlantic from north to south, the final duel played out right in front of Itaja and with the Les Conservateurs ultimately getting the upper hand on VMB. While winners celebrate, another sailor and an NC Sports colleague, Sébastien Destrumeau, was not so lucky last week on board Face Ocean. Here is his report at the time of the accident, and then we'll have Sébastien connecting with the newsroom for a live update from the port of Toulon. You're watching the selling updates. Welcome to the office. Uh, an office a bit, a bit sad today, as you can uh, see. Uh, we are the 12th of November, just about a year from the start of the Vendée Globe, and uh, all this mess is uh, the mast of Face Ocean. We just broke the mast. Uh, it's catastrophic, uh, but uh, nobody's injured. Everybody's fine. And uh, what we're doing now is taking all the pieces, the bits and pieces. Uh, from the water, off the water, putting it back on board the boat and uh, we've got a tugboat coming out to rescue us uh, within the next couple of hours, we should be fine. Uh, it's a major setback for our preparation obviously, but then the boat is uh, supposed to be on the hard stand for six months, so plenty of time for us to uh, recover from this and thanks to you and thanks to your help we're going to be on the start line of the Vendée Globe the 6th of November 2016. The Vendée Globe is a very hard race 
and we just have an example today with the mast falling off the boat. And we have Sebastian now linking in with NC Sports from the deck of Face Ocean in Toulon. Hello Seb, not a great week for Face Ocean as we just saw from your piece, but it's good to see you. Well, Mia, you, you're right. It was not a fantastic week for us um, on Face Ocean. But um, yeah, and plenty of work, as you can see behind me. Uh, but it's part and parcel of uh, the Vendée Globe, I guess. Which starts in a year. How does this affect the program for the Team Face Ocean? Okay, Mia, well, this boat is my boat, right? And, uh, and I love her, and she just had uh, a little bit of a hiccup, like, you know, uh, as they do sometimes. And, uh, but it doesn't stop us from um, getting ready for the Vendée Globe. I'm actually, actually thinking about it now. Um, I'm actually very grateful that this uh, accident happened a year out from the Vendée Globe. Uh, it would have been a completely different story uh, if, uh, if uh, the piece that failed, uh, failed in six months from now. The boat is supposed to be on the hard stand very, very shortly for the winter refit. And um, I'm very glad we put this uh, extra sail uh, and, and broke the mast, which is unfortunate. But uh, somehow there's uh, a lot of positive to take out of this, uh, of this incident. You're a world-class sailor with experience in the Volvo Ocean Race, five editions of the America's Cup and World Championships. Now, you're also among the top journalists bringing the sport to the mainstream. So, what's your objective at this Vendée Globe? Well, as you know, as you know Mia, uh, to be uh, at the start of the Vendée Globe is, is a major victory. To finish the Vendée Globe is a, is a small miracle. Uh, only 50% of the fleet um, finished the Vendée Globe. And, uh, and uh, my aim is not to win the Vendée Globe. I don't have the boat and I don't have the skills to win the Vendée Globe. I'm not in the Vendée Globe for this. I'm in the Vendée Globe to win my race, uh, which is uh, to finish the Vendée Globe and bring all my supporters and fans with me uh, across the, the finishing line. This boat is a very good boat. Um, it, 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 it did full laps around the world and uh, never failed. Uh, so uh, this boat will finish the Vendée Globe. But, um, but this masting uh, is uh, just a small hiccup and I take that as a very lucky omen. It will be a great adventure and Nautical Channel will of course be with you every step of the way. You must be having a very busy time with the many repairs on board Face Ocean, so we'll leave you to it. Well, thank you Mia for having us. A day on the X-Cat for an Olympic sailor in Abu Dhabi. Preview of the Nautique 2015 in Paris and seven legends join the ISAP Hall of Fame. It's all right here, right now, on the NC Sports Briefs. Spain's rising star, Shord Di Zamar, took speed to a whole new level in Abu Dhabi, a stopover on the ISAF Sailing World Cup. Known for speed in the 470 class, Zamad hopped into the cockpit of Team Abu Dhabi's X-Cat alongside throttleman Rashad El Tayar. Soon the duo was up to 110 kilometers per hour in the boat that could bring the 2015 X-Cat world title to the Emirates capital next month. <laughs> it was amazing. You see the speed, like the water going, going really fast. We're used to the speed in, in our boat, that the water fast. Like. Well, thank you to the guys. And and to Isa for, for, for the experience. Helium uh, quick and uh, I think he have the, the background about the sea. Maybe he will, but for now he's got his eyes on the World Cup in Melbourne. Meanwhile, Al Tayer and regular partner Saleh Al Mansouri are focused on winning the x -Cat World title next week on their home waters in Abu Dhabi. The Nautique 2015 is about to kick off at the Salon de Versailles in Paris. 
the city and the nation have shown they will not kneel to fear. And under tightened security, a dense calendar of events awaits the thousands of fans expected at the venue when gates will open on the 5th of December. Next to the massive exposition halls with all the latest releases and power, sale, boards, tech, accessories, and so much more, Nautique will also unveil the 2016 editions of the Tour de France à la Voile and the Transat. Franck Cama from the team Groupama and Yvan Bourgnon are also expected at the venue. Clearly at risk in the current environment, authorities have limited entries in the iconic Nautique sub Paris crossing to just 400 participants. Seven legendary sailors whose shining careers represent over a century of the sport's history were officially inducted into the Hall of Fame last week during ISAF's annual conference in Sanya, China. The lineup for these brand new entries is truly impressive, starting with posthumous recognitions for Herod Vanderbilt and Sir Peter Blake, both America's Cup defenders, as well as for Russian Olympic champion and Italy's historic coach, Valentin Mankin. Other Hall of Fame entries include the USA's Dennis Conner, Buddy Melgez, Brazil's Torben Grael, and Italian windsurfer Alessandra Sensini. This is just the second time that the World Sailing Hall of Fame has inducted new athletes since its inception in 2007. They now join the ranks of sailing's greatest, together with Olin Stevens, Dame Ellen MacArthur, Paul Evstrom, Barbara Kendall, Eric Taberli, and Sir Robin Knox Johnson. The next call will be in 2019. More action coming your way on NC Sports right after the break. When we come back, the world's top surfers flock to Hawaii for the Triple Crown, the future of sailing unveiled at the Yacht Racing Forum in Geneva. Then get ready for the America's Cup, because the road to Bermuda starts here on Nautical Channel. We're back for more NC Sports to discuss the present state and future of pro sailing. On the line now is Yacht Racing Forum CEO Bernard Schopfer with an exclusive preview. Hello Bernard and thanks for being here on NC Sports. Yes, hello Mia, thank you, it's a pleasure for me. So what's the buzz on the upcoming Yacht Racing Forum? Please explain to our viewers what it's all about. So the Yacht Racing Forum is a business-to-business -business conference. It's the annual gathering for all the key people involved in the yacht racing industry. So we have uh, racers, competitors, we have event managers, we have venues, technical suppliers, designers, engineers, uh, etc. You name it, everybody involved in the yacht racing industry worldwide. Now, the forum is just days away, taking place on the 7th and 8th of December in Geneva. And this year, you have both an intense program and impressive speakers list. What are some of the highlights for this 2015 edition? To have a very prominent people like Knut Frostad, François Gabard, Jan Walker, Mark Turner, uh, Guillaume Verdier, Juan Coyumjan, uh, Pat Shaughnessy, etc., etc. We have a huge uh, number of uh, extraordinary speakers and delegates attending this conference and the purpose is to give the opportunity to everyone to meet with each other and to, to generate new contacts and make business. So there's going to be three conferences in parallel. The first conference is business and marketing, then we have design and technology and the third conference is the risk management conference which is a brand new topic we can see that the sport is changing very much with uh, sailors wearing helmets and uh, diving equipment and knives. That's all new and this, it's the sort of things we're going to discuss during this uh, conference. 
Yacht Racing Forum has been at the heart of the incredible sailing evolution in design, production, organization, media management, and more in the last couple decades. This must be a unique opportunity. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mia. That, that's why the forum has to exist, because it's the only occasion in the year where all the people involved in yacht racing can meet and discuss the future of the sport. And it's true that the sport of sailing is very fragmented at the moment and it's very difficult for the public to understand, uh, for example, who is the best sailor in the world, what is the best class, what is the top event. Is there such a thing? Important to understand that the forum is not a decision-making body. We're not there to take decisions for the future of the sport, but we're there to bring everybody together and to help uh, the leaders of the sport to understand what people want, what the industry wants, and have an idea of the direction that the sport needs to take. And in that sense, the forum is a very important event because it's the only event in its kind. It's not easy to make a living as a pro sailor. Uh, so what role do the athletes voices play in this forum? Yeah, you're right. The, the, the question is also, does the sport take a direction that the sailors, the athletes are happy with? And this is sometimes questionable. I'm not there to bring the answer, but I'm just observing, for example, the fact that uh, in the recent trends at Jacques Vabre, most of the foiling Imocas didn't cross the arrival line. And when you speak about this class with people who are participating in the Volvo Ocean race, many of them say they would never go on an Imoca boat because they think they are too dangerous. It's a discussion, it's a matter of debate. And again, I am or the Yacht Racing Forum is not there to take decision on behalf of the industry, but the conference is there to listen to everybody's point of view and to debate it and to put together and define a route that everybody appreciates for the future of the sport. The Nautical Channel team will, of course, be on location in Geneva to cover the very latest from this year's Yacht Racing Forum. In the meantime, thank you so much, Bernard, for this preview, and we'll catch up with you in December for the recap. Fair winds from NC Sports. Thank you, Mia. Looking forward to seeing you. Bye-bye. Hawaii is taking center stage on the global water sports panorama for the rest of this 2015 season. It all starts with the triple crown of surfing, the gateway to the super finals for both the men and women on the WSL Championship Tour. Charlie's Popkey has the report. The Triple Crown of Surfing officially kicked off last Sunday with the Hawaiian Pro. This qualifying series competition takes place on the north shore of Oahu at Haleiwa, home of one of the most iconic waves in the world. It's the first of three in this Hawaiian specialty surf series. Both men and women will compete at the Hawaiian Pro at Haleiwa, followed by the World Cup of Surfing at Sunset Beach at the end of this month. The men stay on the north shore for the pipeline while the ladies head to Honolulu Bay, Maui for the final showdown of a sensational 2015 World Championship Tour. Awarded on the best combined results, the Triple Crown is the last test of the season, a time for champions to be decided. On a mere 450-point lead, will Aussie Mick Fanning hold on to the number one, or can the Brazilians with Toledo, De Souza, or even reigning world champ Medina pull it off? The bookies are busy reworking the odds, but Fanning is still the favorite ticket. The WSL Women's Championship Tour Super Final at the Maui Pro will hit the break at Honolulu Bay at the end of this month. In the ongoing battle for the yellow jersey between Hawaiian Carissa Moore and American Courtney Conlog has truly fired up this 2015 season. Now less than 1,000 points apart, Moore is still number one, but both are forced to win. Carissa could afford a second place, or even worse, but not behind Courtney. Moore does have the hometown advantage, but Conlock has had a spectacular year, and no stranger to the break at Honolulu. Australia's Sally Fitzgibbons is a distant third, and instead has few chances for the title. 
She needs both a win and a complete debacle by the leaders. This weekend, The Road to Bermuda premiered on Nautical Channel. Airing now is the first of 12 episodes dedicated to Bermuda's preparation for the 2017 America's Cup. Rachel Sodden hosts this exciting lifestyle series, bringing us exclusive athlete interviews and local insight. Check out a brand new episode every month and discover the magic of exotic Bermuda. From the Caribbean to Rio de Janeiro, and then all the way to Santander, it's going to be a busy week on the world's oceans. Here's what's coming up on the NC Sports calendar. Wind forecasts look good for the 8th edition of the KTEC Cup in St. Barth, the flagship event of the 815 class, running from the 18th to the 22nd of November. This year, over 100 seasoned pros and feisty amateurs are flocking to the Caribbean island for four days of racing, with a spectacular 15 to 25 knots expected on the race course. This is the class that began it all, bringing fast sailing to the forefront well before the recent foiling revolution. No wonder it still attracts so many world-class athletes. British sailor Sam Goodchild will make his first appearance at the KTEC Cup, as well as several Argentinian crews. Veterans Darren Bundog from Australia and Frenchman Ivan Bourgnon will join them on the starting line. Full we'll recap and results in the next NC Sports Edition. Over 250 Olympic hopefuls from 40 different countries will be meeting up in Aquese, Brazil from November 16th to the 29th for the last canoe slalom test event before the Rio Games coming up next summer. With its 250 meters in length, the new artificial course at Whitewater Stadium on the Itaipu Channel is now officially operational and ready to go. The discipline became an Olympic sport back in the 1930s. 18 to 25 gates will challenge the C1 singles and C2 doubles along the descent. The competition format will include the classic qualifying heats, followed by direct elimination in the quarters, semis, and ultimately, the final. The Punta Galea Challenge Invitational is officially on and will last until February 2016. Just 32 WSL Big Wave Tour riders have been admitted on the famous Spanish break in La Vaca Grande. Discovered in 2006 by locals Oscar Gomez and Luis Garcia near Santander, Las Canteras has now become a prime big wave spot in Europe. Top-notch pros the likes of American Nick Lamb, a winner here last year, and Hawaiian's Makuakai Rothman with the legendary Garrett McNamara are also expected in the Basque region. Time's up for this edition, but NC Sports will be back next week with the very latest results and exclusive insight. From the newsroom, I'm Mia Chiran, and remember, plunge into the action with NC Sports.